Welcome back everyone to lecture number four on China and Japan in the early modern era. Now one big theme of our class has been colonization. Specifically we've already referred to European colonization of the Americas by Spain, Portugal, and then later the English, the French, and the Dutch. Ultimately, though, even East Asia will be colonized by Europeans. So we want to talk a little bit today about uh, China and Japan before sustained takeover by foreign powers. So we'll begin our story with China under the Ming Dynasty. The Ming Dynasty was built on the ashes of the Yuan or Mongol Empire. Mongol domination of this region began to recede by the 14th century. Their empire suffered from a tremendous amount of internal factionalism, peasant uprisings, and in their place, as Mongol leadership receded, we will see under the charismatic leadership of a man by the name of Hong Wu, uh, the Ming Dynasty will be founded. Hong Wu was a former peasant who had lost his family due to famine during the end of the Mongol era. He was the third of only three Chinese emperors in their entire history to come from this peasant class. As a result of his humble origins, Hong Wu, once in power, created laws that helped ease the life of poor farmers across his empire. For example, he kept the land taxes low, and he also maintained reserves of food and grain so that famine would not threaten his people. Hong Wu passed away in 1398, and under several of his successors, we will see some significant advancements under Ming leadership. For instance, the Ming government will sponsor a series of maritime expeditions, naval voyages crisscrossing the Indian Ocean. All in all, seven trips were made, one making it as far to the east coast of Africa. In other words, 50 years before the Portuguese under Vasco da Gama made it there, Chinese ships had already arrived in the region. Other areas of innovation under the Ming Dynasty included advances in porcelain production. We see intellectual achievement, dictionaries being composed, encyclopedias to contain important information from various fields of study, from geography to music to medicine. The Great Wall of China will be finally completed as well under Ming leadership. Yet despite their progress on many fronts, we will see that the Ming Dynasty, similar to prior Chinese dynasties, will ultimately fall into a period of slow corruption and decay. Later in the Ming Dynasty, China will suffer from a series of weak leaders who will actually be overpowered by their own employees. Uh, groups such as the eunuchs and mandarins will start to basically drown out the voices of successive Ming emperors. Constant warfare against Japan, as well as many tribal peoples, including the Mongols, will drain the treasury of the Ming dynasty over time. We'll also see a little climate blip in the early 1600s, what becomes known as the Little Ice Age, will result in drought during the summer and severe winters. This will result in famine outbreaks as many crops are compromised over time. Adding insult to injury, the deadliest earthquake in human history will occur in 1556 in the Shangxi province, uh, an estimated death toll of more than 800,000 victims. Because of these escalating internal problems, it leaves the Ming weak and susceptible to outside invasion. And that's precisely what will take place when another ethnic group, the Manchu from the north, will sweep down to take control and establish the Qing dynasty. Qing leadership hailed from an area known as Manchuria, north of the Great Wall. And they were ethnically distinct from the Han majority in China. What was life like under the Qing? Well, although they were less than 2% of the population, uh, they will impose their will on the majority Chinese population. They maintain their firm grip on power by excluding native Chinese from their own government and military affairs. For example, Qing officials spent their summers back home in Manchuria, a region that was kept off limits to the Han Chinese majority. They also banned intermarriage among the Chinese and continued to speak their own language using their own writing system. They also sought to impose their cultural dominance regarding even how people dressed or groomed themselves 
For instance, under the Qing dynasty, all Chinese males now had to dress like the Manchu, and this included shaving their foreheads and braiding their hair in back. Anyone who resisted and balked at these new requirements was summarily executed by the new government. A popular saying during the time was, lose your hair or lose your head. This kind of second-class treatment of the Chinese by their Qing rulers did not go unnoticed. It caused a great deal of resentment over time, and one Qing ruler was wise enough to realize this. Kangxi. Kangxi assumed rule at the age of 15 and went on to become the longest ruler in Chinese history, a reign of 61 years. He understood that people had lost patience with their treatment at the hands of these foreigners, as they were still considered to be. As a result, he will implement a series of reforms aimed at appeasing the masses. For instance, he will lower taxes, easing some discontent. He will increase the number of Chinese officials who were allowed into the highest levels of the government. Beyond that, Kangxi also sought to geographically expand his empire through warfare. He will be successful at taking on the Mongols and taking over portions of Tibet and large regions in Central Asia, and also taking over regions of Southeast Asia, including portions of Northern Vietnam, Burma, and Nepal. Kangxi will also emphasize Confucian philosophy, emphasizing the obedience of the subjects to their ruler. This instruction to obey authority even flowed down into individual households. Chinese society was a patriarchal society. The eldest male was in charge of the household, and women were expected to be obedient to their husbands. In the so-called Sacred Edict of 1670, you can see the instructions to Chinese citizens about how they should be obedient within the household and how they must maintain and regulate their behavior for good moral conduct, uh, advising against gambling and drinking wine, all things designed to try to create an orderly, obedient society. Successive Qing rulers will also implement a number of other important cultural and economic changes. Under the rule of Qianlong, the population of China had increased dramatically um, to number some 300 million people by the year 1800. So new crops were needed, uh, and so several of these were introduced from the New World. Crops such as sweet potatoes and corn made it possible to sustain this burgeoning population. Trade was encouraged. We're seeing the beginnings of some industrialization in China under the Qing Dynasty. We also begin to see a new faith come into the region, Christianity. By the Ming era, the Jesuits, a Catholic order, were meeting with some limited success in establishing their religion in the region. When it came to trade with foreigners, though, or outsiders, this is where China is going to draw a pretty strong line in the sand. For many centuries, uh, Various Chinese leaders had been rather leery of too much trade with foreigners. While there was some trade with Westerners selling items like tea, porcelain, silks, and spices, we're beginning to see that by the late Qing era, the Chinese were becoming increasingly suspicious that trade was being used as a way to open up the door to possible colonization by these foreign powers in their region. As a result, under the Qing Dynasty, we'll see that trade with foreign entities will be strictly governed and strictly limited to just a handful of port cities, such as Macau and Canton. This severely restricted access to the Chinese market will begin to frustrate foreign powers such as Britain, France, and the United States. And ultimately, a number of these outside powers, by the time we get to the 19th century, will begin to try to forcibly introduce their trade goods into China over time. More on that in a later lecture. Now I want to move on to medieval Japan. And one thing we need to understand is the incredibly rigid class system that existed in Japan and had been in existence for a number of centuries. If you look at the chart here on the slide, you'll notice that Japan also had a position known as emperor, very similar to that of China. 
But that's where the similarity ends. In Japan, unlike in China, Japanese emperors were largely ceremonial figures. They had some religious authority, but they were not responsible for the day-to-day -day running of political and military affairs in Japan. Instead, those duties were delegated to the position of shogun. You can see that right underneath the position of emperor. However, even various shoguns with the emperor's consent were not able to halt the chronic warfare that tended to plague Japanese society for centuries. Underneath the shogun, you'll see the daimyos. Uh, these are the leaders of very powerful clans known as the Uji. And this class of warriors in the nobility were not necessarily inclined often to listen to what anyone else had to say. And so we see a lot of internal warfare marring Japanese civilization for several centuries. In fact, during the early 1500s, Japan was so badly divided that what amounted to an extended civil war raged between 1467 and 1568. This is known as the Age of Warring States. And as if things weren't bad enough with traditional warfare, by this stage, the Portuguese had began landing in the south in Japan in a limited sense and exchanging western firearms or guns, uh, lightning sticks as they became known, uh, for other trade items with the Japanese. So this introduces even more deadlier forms of weapons technology into this uh, chronically warring society. What was needed was strong leadership, and in Japanese history there are the three so-called great unifiers of Japan, the first of those being Oda Nobunaga. And the only way you unify Japan is forcibly during this period. He began this process by capturing the capital of Kyoto. He then set about breaking the power of the regional daimyos by destroying their forts. He'll also begin enacting a series of reforms, such as standardizing the currency, eliminating customs barriers and encouraging trade. He took the fateful step as well of opening Japan up for a little while to the West, including inviting Jesuit minis minis missionaries excuse me, in and incorporating Western firearms into battle. Despite his successes, however, he was eventually captured in battle by rivals and was forced to commit suicide before being killed by one of his own traitorous generals. His successor will be Hideyoshi. Hideyoshi had been one of the loyal generals of Oda Nobunaga and seeking revenge for his death. He will decree that all peasants be disarmed immediately in what becomes known as the Sword Hunt of 1588. By depriving many citizens of their weapons, he hoped to calm down the internal conflict. Hideyoshi will also work towards banning slavery and unfree labor. He will order surveys of the land and a complete census of Japan that will become the basis of a new system of taxation. He will be unlike his former leader Nobunaga, though, in his intolerance for Christianity. The last of the three great unifiers of Japan will be Tokugawa Ieyasu. Ieyasu came to power violently through a series of assassinations and but through faking his own genealogy, claiming a nobility that his family actually did not have, he was able, with the right military assistance, to establish what becomes known as the Tokugawa Shogunate. While he was undeniably ruthless and ambitious, we'll also see that he will be a patron of the arts and scholarship. He was very fond of the philosophy of Confucianism, for example. He was also savvy enough to understand that the only way to break the power of the regional warlords was to invite them into his own house. Not into his house, but invite them to the city, the capital city at the time, so that they could be watched over. He forced the nobility to spend every other year at the capital where he and his troops could oversee their, you know, what they were talking about, make sure that they weren't plotting against him. And you can see the famous maxim, Oda pounds the national rice cake, Hideyoshi needs it, and in the end, Iyasu sits down and eats it. He's the one that, that finishes this process of unifying Japan. Now, while Japan had become wealthy over time by trading with foreign powers in items like swords, wine bottles, fans, screen paintings, and the like, uh, when Iyasu takes power, he believes that it's time for Japan to close its door to the outside world in a bid to protect themselves militarily, culturally, the practice of Sokoku will be implemented. 
Christians will be expelled, and under royal edicts now, Japanese people are no longer allowed to travel abroad, and foreign trade will be strictly controlled under this closed-door policy of Sokoku.